words to which I should like to call your attention this morning are to be found in the first epistle of Peter, in the first chapter, in verses 3, 4, and 5. Verses 3, 4, and 5 in the first chapter of the first epistle of Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith, unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now there you see in that mighty and magnificent benediction and doxology almost, the Apostle Peter bursts forth at the very beginning of his letter. After the briefest of uh, salutations, he suddenly, I say, breaks forth in these uh, thrilling and uh, mighty words. Now, in doing this, the apostle, of course, was not doing anything unique. He was doing what all the early Christians did. He was doing what all the writers of these New Testament epistles invariably do. The moment they begin to mention the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they, in this way, I say, burst forth into some great description of praise to him. Take the Apostle Paul, for instance, in writing to the Ephesians. Again, in the third verse, he does the same thing. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, etc., etc. And he goes on until the end of the 14th verse in that great epistle. Now, this then is obviously the great characteristic of the true Christian. It's the great characteristic note of the New Testament. As I say, it was the characteristic note of the early church. The early church was a church characterized by praise, characterized by a sense of joy. Blessed be the God and Father. That was their note. And as I say, you get it even at the very beginning. Now, this is something that was not confined to the early church. If you read the long history and story of the Christian church, you will find that this has been characteristic of the church always in every period of revival. At any period of reformation and renewal, this original note has come back, and the church has literally been thrilling with a sense of praise and of joy. You see, an apostle like this, as I'm indicating, can't take up his pen and write, and write even to people who are suffering a good deal of trial and tribulation as he wrote to them. He can't do so without starting in this mighty and magnificent manner. Very well, let us as Christian people ask ourselves the obvious question before we go any further. Is this the characteristic of our Christian life and witness? Is this what we feel? Is this our response to the gospel? Is this, I ask, our actual experience in this modern world and in spite of everything that is so true round and about us? Now that, I feel, is the most important thing for us to say to ourselves this morning. We claim to be Christians, we make our profession of faith. But in the last analysis, this is the test of it all. Is there that spirit within us, which was in this apostle, and in the people to whom he wrote? He is able to say of them, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. He later says of them, whom having not seen, ye love in whom, though now ye see him not yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. 
He says that about ordinary Christian people like ourselves. He knew that that was true of them. And therefore I say the most important question for us to face is just that. Here we meet together on Easter morning. Claiming to believe this great fact of the resurrection of the Son of God. But the question is, what is our response to it? What is our feeling? What is our reaction to this great message which we claim to believe? Now, if we can say that we are like the Apostle, and that contemplating it all, we've got nothing to say but blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, if that is our position, the words that we're going to consider will confirm us in that and strengthen us and add to it and increase it. But if we can't say that honestly, well, I say, let us pay heed to what the Apostle tells us. Because here he fortunately, as is the custom of all these writers, let us into the secret of why he felt that himself. Why he must always burst forth in this great praise and worship and adoration and thanksgiving. Well, now then, let's follow him. Let's meditate with him upon this great fact. What he tells us, in essence, is this. There is a great fundamental principle here, and that is that the resurrection is vital and central to the whole position of the Christian. You see, you notice his argument. Blessed, he says, be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again to a lively hope. But how has he done it? By, through, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's the center. That is the foundation. That is the thing which makes it all possible and brings it all to us. So we see that our controlling principle is that uh, there is no Christianity apart from the resurrection. It is vital. It is absolutely essential. This apostle could never have written like that were it not uh, for the resurrection. If you doubt that, read the beginning of the 21st chapter of the Gospel according to St. John, where you see these apostles, Peter amongst them, after the death and crucifixion and burial of our Lord, utterly downcast, quite disconsolate, miserable, unhappy, so much so that Peter, turning to the others, said, I go a fishing felt he must do something to relieve the tension and the misery and the unhappiness. And what was it that transformed him into the man that was able to say, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ that hath begotten us again unto a living hope? Well, it, it was this, the resurrection. Very well, I say, this is something which is basic and foundational. And if a man doesn't believe in the resurrection... Whatever else he may be, he has no right to call himself a Christian. The great message which was preached by the apostles, as you'll find in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, was this, Jesus and the resurrection. They would never have preached at all but for that. This was their theme, Jesus and the resurrection. Very well. Well, now then, what is it that uh, the resurrection does? Why is it so foundational and so central? Let me try to divide up what the Apostle says for your consideration. The first thing he says is this. It gives us a lively hope. We've been begotten again, he says, to a lively hope. Now, a better translation here is to say a living hope. Because if it's living, it's lively. A thing which is dead doesn't move, it's lifeless. But if there's life, there's liveliness, a lively hope, a living hope. Why do you think he troubles to describe it in that way? Well, I think there can be no doubt about this at all. He is uh, contrasting it to something which is vague and shadowy and uncertain and merely general. Now, there is so much that passes for the Christian hope today 
which at once is exposed as counterfeit when you test it by this adjective living, lively. What is the message of this Easter morning? Is it just some vague message to say that spring has come again and after the death of winter there are signs of life, something vague and general belonging to nature? Is that the resurrection hope? There are many who say it is. And that that, all, that that is all this day's got to say to us. That there's always a turn. That you always go round the circle and come back to the spring. So we must never despair. That, they say, is the message of Easter. Something vague, nebulous, as indefinite as that. That's not what Peter's talking about. But begotten us again to a living hope. Something substantial, something certain, something that is vibrant with life and with power. And of course, that is essential for this reason. He says the great thing about this hope is that it enables us to live. Peter, as I've already reminded you, was writing this letter to a number of people who were experiencing a very, very hard time. Though now, for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. It's the great theme of this first epistle of Peter. You'll find that he mentions it in every single chapter. In the second chapter, he says, Look, yeah, you're having a hard time, but understand this, he says, you're simply following in his steps, who did no wrong, who was without guile, who when he suffered, he threatened not. He's got it in the third chapter. He mentions the times of Noah and the few godly remnant of people that were left in that godless age. He mentions it again in the fourth chapter. He says, don't be amazed and surprised at this fiery trial that is trying you and that's going to try you more. Don't be surprised. And then he ends up in his last chapter in his doxology by saying that after he have suffered a while, well, now then, in other words, you see, the New Testament is very practical. This isn't a sort of fairy tale. This isn't the optimism of the novelist. This isn't the cheeriness that is affected by the statesmen and the politicians. No, no, this is realism. This doesn't minimize problems and difficulties and trials. Its whole purpose is to show this, that whatever they are, however bad they may be, however dark and cruel and ugly, it doesn't matter. We've got a living hope that can hold us, that can sustain us, that can enable us not only to endure, but to be more than conquerors. That's the note of the New Testament. We can look at it all and smile in the face of it. Paul says it, same thing in Romans 8. We, he says, are actually being led daily as a sheep to the slaughter. Everything's against us. Doesn't matter, he says. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conqueror through him that loved us. That's the living hope. It's a hope, I say, that not only enables a man to go through the very worst that hell can produce against him. It can enable him to do so with a sense of joy. With a sense of triumph. With a sense of assurance. That's what the apostle is saying. That's his message. He says we've been begotten again into a lively, a living hope. Well, now then, how is it that the resurrection does this? I do trust we're examining ourselves as I go on from point to point. Have you got this sense within you that you're more than conqueror? What's your attitude to your circumstances this morning? In your personal life, in your married and home life, in your business, your profession, the group to which you belong, the whole world as it is this morning. What's your reaction to it? Does this great fact of the resurrection give you a sense of certainty, of triumph, of assurance, and of joy? Are you rejoicing in your tribulations? Are you lifted up above them? Are you able to say, looking at them all, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
He does this, says the apostle. He gives us this living, lively hope through the resurrection. Well, very well then, here is the important matter for us. What does he mean by this? How does the resurrection give those who believe in it truly this living, lively hope? And here it seems to me that we must divide our answer into two sections. The resurrection did, does this in the first instance because of what it did to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. This is done to us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So there's the starting point. And that is what I meant by emphasizing at the beginning that the whole basis of the Christian faith is that the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is a literal fact. What I mean by a literal fact is this, that the apostle was referring not to the fact that the Lord Jesus who'd been crucified on the Friday was still alive in the spirit realm. That isn't what he means at all. What he is referring to is that he literally came out of the grave. That he came out of the grave in the body. That the body which had been crucified on the Friday and which had been taken down when he died and put into that sepulcher had left the sepulcher. The empty grave is at the basis of all this. Now, I'm emphasizing this, of course, for this good reason. You probably have been reading, as I've been reading, in uh, various uh, newspapers, articles on the resurrection and on Easter and so on, and you will have found probably that nearly all of them refer to the fact that it means just survival. And of course, it means nothing of the sort. We are not here to merely celebrate survival of personality. That's not the message of Easter Day that was believed in before Easter. It is believed in by many today who are not Christians at all. No, no. The specific message of the Christian faith is this. That our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who was crucified and who died and was buried, was raised from the dead in the body. That he came out, complete personality, body, as well as everything else, out of that grave which was left empty. Hence you see the details which you observed in that 20th chapter of John's Gospel as they're in the others. Now they're careful to note that the napkin around the head was in a different position from the other grave clothes, just to give you details, to show you that this is literal historical fact, giving as minute a report as that, good enough to satisfy any detective that wants to investigate. The evidence for this great fact is as definite and as certain as any fact in the whole long history of the human race. Very well, then, it tells us that he was raised from the dead by the power of the Father. What does that mean? Well, now, looking at it in the light of the whole movement of salvation, what it means is this. And this is the Christian and the New Testament way of looking at it. Here is the eternal Son of God, the second person in the blessed Holy Trinity. Having been from eternity in the bosom of the Father, having spent his eternal existence in that ineffable glory, at a given point, he enters into time, what for? Well, for men and his salvation. And what did he do? Well, he took into himself the human nature. He entered into this world and into the realm of sin and of death. He was, says the Apostle Paul, made of a woman, made under the law. You see, you can't understand these things except theologically. It means this, that he who was entirely glorious and divine became man also. The word was made flesh. And in doing that, he was not only made of a woman, but he was made under the law. He came into this sinful world as a man amongst men. He didn't cease to be God, but he became man in addition. Complete man. He had a human body such as you and I have, 
With the infirmities, no element of sin, but the infirmities were there. And they're shown as you read the accounts of his life in the pages of the four Gospels. And he was subject to temptation. As God, he couldn't be tempted. But as men, he not only could be tempted, he was tempted. Now then, he came into this world and thus he identified himself with us. But you remember it went even further. As men, I say, he was subject to temptations, tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. All the opposition of the devil and his followers, all the malignity of hell was turned upon him. He came down in order to do that, and he passed through all that. These enemies of God, these infernal powers, were determined to destroy him because they knew that he was the Son of God. You'll find in the Gospels the devils recognizing him and begging of him to leave them alone. Well, here they were, all massed against him and determined to destroy him and the whole purpose of God connected with him. And uh, finally, we see it coming to this, that not only were all these powers set against him, we see something still more amazing and extraordinary. We see him being led to the cross and there being nailed upon it. What is really happening there? Well, what is happening there, according to the Scriptures, is that God, as Peter puts it in his second chapter here, was laying on him our sins, who bear our sins, he says, in his own body on the tree. God hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. What does it mean? Well, it means this. He was born, I say, made under the law. And there on the cross on Calvary's hill, all that the law has got to say against sin was said. All the punishment that the law meets out upon sin and guilt and evil and shame was poured out upon him. That is what was happening there. The law, the righteous demands of the law of God were being fulfilled. They were all poured out upon him. That's what he was doing. And it led to his death. It was the cause of his death. Without shedding of blood there is no remission of sins. And so he died. And his body was taken down and buried in the grave. Then comes this great and momentous fact. This is the thing, this is Peter, that thrills me and grips me and moves me and makes me cry out in worship and in adoration. He didn't remain in the grave. He was brought out of it, unscathed, conquering, appearing to his chosen followers, ascending into heaven, taking down his seat again in the everlasting glory. Now, that is the first and the most important thing for us to grasp. What does it mean? Well, let, the, let us listen to the Apostle Paul's exposition of it in the sixth chapter of the Epistle to the Romans. He puts it like this. Knowing, he says, that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Now, do you get the significance of that? That's the heart of the gospel. What it means is this. Once. In that he died, he died unto sin once. Death, he says, hath no more dominion over him. He did have at one point. You see, this is the whole marvel and miracle of the incarnation and all that the Son of God did and was done to him. He subjected himself to all that the law has got to say about sin, made of a woman, made under the law. He is under the law. Not that he had ever sinned, not that he was sinful, but it's identification with us. He's taken his place by our side. He submitted to baptism for that reason. Suffer it to be so now, he says. He's one with us. He's come about our sins. So he's under the law. And the law condemns, and it condemned him for us, for our sins. He died unto sin once. He died once, but no more. 
You see, the resurrection, com- the resurrection is a great announcement of this. That he has finished the work he came to do. He is no longer under the law. He is back in glory. Why? Well, he's done everything that the law could demand. The law has exhausted itself upon him. He will die no more. He needn't have died at all. He deliberately came into the realm of sin and of death in this life in order to deliver us from it. But he's finished with it. He's up the other side. He came from glory. He came down under the law into the realm of sin and of death. He's finished it. He's up the other side. He dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. That's the meaning of the resurrection. He's gone back into that realm outside sin and law and death. He is back in the eternal realm of glory. That's the meaning of the resurrection. He has conquered the realm of law and of sin and of death. He's vanquished them. He's gone right through them. And he's up, I say, the other side and has returned to the glory whence he came. Well, now, there is the first thing, but listen. What the apostle is saying is this, that you and I have this lively hope, partly because that happened to him. Yes, but still more because of what happened to us. What happened to us? What do you mean, says someone? Well, listen to the apostle's word. Blessed, he says, be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. You notice, begotten us again. What does that mean? Well, he uses exactly the same word in the 23rd verse of this chapter where he says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. Hath begotten us again. We've been born again unto a living hope. That's the very term that he uses. What does it mean? Well, it means this. The truth about a Christian is not simply that he believes in the Lord Jesus Christ and that he believes that Christ was risen from the dead. Oh yes, of course he believes that. And you can't be a Christian without believing that, I repeat. But you know, that isn't the whole truth about the Christian. The Christian is a man who has been regenerated unto a living hope. Born again unto a living hope. What does this mean? Well, of course, regeneration means new life. We've been born again into a living hope. You'll never have this hope until you're born again. The natural man hasn't got it. He is without hope in the world. Without hope, without God, without Christ in the world. The only man who's got this living hope, the only man who can smile in the face of death, is the man who's been regenerated, born again, begotten again. Well, how does it happen, says someone? The answer is, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We are regenerated, born again, through, by, through the agency, the medium of, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. How does that do it, says someone? Well, you know, this is to me the most remarkable of all the Christian doctrines. It is the doctrine of our union with Christ. We are one with him. And what happened to him happened to us. Let Paul again expound in Romans 6. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, he says, how shall we that die to sin live any longer therein? Then listen. Know ye not That so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. And then he goes on. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, 
being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. Likewise, reckon ye yourselves also to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ. It's the thing he says everywhere. If ye then be risen with Christ, your life is hid with Christ in God. Listen to it in Ephesians 2. You were he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sin. But God, who is rich in mercy, even while we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, and hath raised us up together with him, and hath caused us to sit with him in the heavenly places in Christ. Do you see how it all happens as the result of the resurrection? This is how a man gets the living hope. It is because he is joined to Christ, he is in this blessed state of union with Christ. So that what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ happened to him also. Christ and his people are one. He is the head, we are the body. And when he died, we died. He was buried in our grave, we were buried with him. When he rose, we rose. So that the apostle says that as he is dead to the law and dead to sin and dead to death, so are we. A Christian is a man who can say, I am dead to sin. I am dead to the law. I am dead to death. Death has no dominion over a Christian. He simply falls on sleep. He's already passed through what death really means. He'll never taste death. Christ has tasted it for him. He's alive with Christ in a new life. He has been begotten again, regenerated, unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's how it happens. What does it lead to? Well, he says the hope to which it leads is this. It is this living hope. What is the living hope? Well, he says it is an inheritance which is incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, which is reserved in heaven for us. What is the hope of the Christian this morning? My dear friend, it's not merely survival. There are foolish people who are saying that this is but survival. I remind you again that survival of the dead was believed in before Christ ever came into this world. You needn't fall back upon, upon the phenomena of spiritualism to believe in the resurrection. If you do, you're denying the resurrection. This was not some mere spirit appearance. This was the body that had been crucified itself being glorified and rising and appearing before the people. The message of Easter morning is not survival. That's not it at all. It is this hope to which it brings us. Not that we shall go on living when we die. No, no. It is something infinitely beyond that. What is it? Well, it is essentially this. The resurrection of the body. Our spirits, as we've seen, are already resurrected. We've been begotten again, regenerated, born anew. A man who's a Christian is a man who's already renewed in spirit. Yes, but here we are told that he shall be renewed in body also. What does it mean? It means this. We shall enter into this inheritance, says the apostle, and we shall enter into it as complete personalities. When the Christian dies, he doesn't go to some vague, shadowy realm, some kind of Elysium. Don't believe in the so-called teaching of that old Greek mythology, the river Styx and so on. No, no, forget all that and all the nonsense of spiritism. This is real. This is complete personality. Not a spirit floating in some vague atmosphere, but the complete man, body, soul, and spirit renewed and glorified, and entering into his everlasting inheritance. That's the thing we've been begotten unto, to an inheritance, which is incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven by God, 
for us who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. What is all this? Well, it means this. God made this world perfect, paradise, put men in it, and men was perfect. And you know, God's not going to be satisfied until all that has been restored. I don't spend the Easter Sunday morning in protesting against bombs. My dear friends, I've got a message infinitely higher. This old world is doomed. It's a sinful world. It's an evil world. And it can never be made a good world by men. He can protest. He can march. He can pass his acts of parliament. He'll never do it. Sin is in himself. When he was put in paradise, he turned it into a place of shame. Oh, no, men can never put this world right. But thank God, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ that hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And to what well? I know this this morning. That this whole world is going to be renewed. The Lord Jesus Christ said, when the regeneration shall take place, when the Son of Man returns again, read about it in Matthew 19, the regeneration that's going to take place in the cosmos. When? Oh, when this Lord Jesus Christ comes back again. That's the message. He's triumphed over all these enemies. He's risen. He's seated at the right hand of God. What's he doing? Waiting until his enemies shall all be made his footstool. Then he will come back again. As the King of kings and as the Lord of lords. He will destroy out of existence all that is evil and sinful and vile and ugly and foul. He will renew the whole creation. And he will bring in his glorious kingdom the city of God, the new, the heavenly Jerusalem, will descend and God will make his tabernacle amongst men. And this is what it means to us, you know, that if we are Christian, that you and I shall be there, not as floating vague spirits in a shadowy existence, no, no, in this body glorified, delivered from all vestiges of illness, weakness, sin and shame. This body, I will be identified as myself. I will be in a glorified body. We are waiting, says Paul to the Philippians, for the return of this Son of God. Our citizenship is in heaven. We are looking for his coming again. Who shall change this our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body? according to the working of that mighty power whereby he is able to subdue even all things unto himself. That's what it means. That's the inheritance. It's coming. And I am going into that. And I know it now. I've been born again into this hope. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Oh, the blessedness of this knowledge. You and I are in an old world that may be blown to nothing at any moment. Does that depress you? Is that the thing that's monopolizing all your thought? Is that the one thing to be talking about always? If so, I don't hesitate to assert you're not a Christian. The Christian has got his eye on another land. He sees this old world after that regeneration when the Son of God shall come. And what does he see about it? Ha <laughs> ha, it is incorruptible. It'll be undefiled. It'll never fade away. Nothing from outside will be able to affect this. Incorruptible. The devil and all his cohorts and powers will have been cast into the lake of destruction. Whatever that may mean. And they'll be helpless. There will be nothing evil or sinful in itself. It's undefiled. And it'll never fade away. It'll go on forever and forever and forever. Everlasting glory. That's the hope. That's the inheritance. 
That's the thing which I've been born again unto. That's the thing that sustains me. So I look out upon this evil, sinful world this morning. It doesn't depress me. I expect nothing better from it. Whatever may be going against me, whatever may be happening in my own body, I know I must expect this. Sin has led to all this. But though I die and I shall die, I shall rise again and I shall see him face to face. I shall see him as he is. And blessed, I shall be like him. In a glorified body with everything renewed. And I shall be living in a realm which is incorruptible and undefiled. And that can never fade away. Christian people, that's the hope of the resurrection. That's the message of this Easter morning. And you see, it is absolutely safe. The, the resurrection itself guarantees it all. Every enemy has been destroyed. Christ has conquered every one of them. What do you mean, says the author of the epistle to the Hebrews in his second chapter? You are saying that God made men and that he put everything under him. But we see not everything put under him. I agree, says that man. And then he answers, but we see Jesus. Oh, for the suffering of death was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor. And he's our forerunner. He's gone to prepare a place for us. And he will come again and receive us unto himself. And he will usher us into his own glorious kingdom. We shall reign with him as kings and priests. We shall judge the world. We shall judge angels. It's guaranteed. Nothing can stop it. Can't death stop it? Of course not. He's conquered it. Can't the devil? No, he's vanquished. Can't hell? No, no. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? He's vanquished. He's conquered every enemy. And his resurrection pronounces that. He's risen triumphant o'er the grave. Nor life, nor death, nor hell, nor anything else could defeat him. He is the King of kings and he is the Lord of lords. Christian people, have you got this living hope? Is you or I set upon that inheritance that he's purchased for you? Is there something within you at this moment that is crying out, however feebly, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ that hath begotten us again out of the hopelessness and the despair and the failure and the sin and the shame and the disease and the death and the hell of this life unto an inheritance which is incorruptible and undefiled and that will never fade away which is reserved for us by God, the same God who even keeps us, gives us power, strength, ability to endure and to triumph in spite of everything. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.